So good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Professor Clive Speak from University of Birmingham. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here tonight uh, for our last in the series of our West Midlands Institute of Physics Lectures for Schools. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Maria Pavidou, who's, who's a very talented and uh, a talented physicist and also a musician. And, uh, and she's going to talk to us about how we can make musical instruments sing. So just before we start, I'd like to uh, tell you about uh, Maria's uh, biography. So she started a career as a teacher of physics and music at the Experimental Music High School in Palini in Greece. She subsequently came to the UK and completed her PhD at Cardiff University on the acoustics of uh, the, acoustic, the classical guitar. Her personal journey brought her back to the UK, where she became a science teacher, a head of physics, and finally an outreach officer at the, at the University of Birmingham here, where she actually gave uh, a very, very well appreciated uh, course in uh, the physics of music. In 2020, Dr. Pavlidou established Galileo's Voyage, which is a science education company that specializes in physics and astronomy and supports science and mathematics teaching and learning from primary and secondary schools to early university years. Dr. Pavlidou is a STEM ambassador and has served as a member of the Institute of Physics. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Maria and we look forward to a great talk. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm going to stop uh, my video because uh, when I share my screen, I want to ensure that there is no lagging. So um, you're not going to see me, but you will be able to hear me. So in my talk today, I would like to explain how instruments create sound and how that sound can be shaped to be more musically useful or interesting. My talk overview can be seen on the screen. We're going to talk about what is a musical sound, a classification of musical instruments, free and forced oscillations in musical instruments. We are then going to look at the anatomy of stringed instruments and winged instruments. And we're going to finish with experimental techniques and sound radiation and perception. I would like to start by looking at some of the big questions in musical acoustics. We strive to make better instruments as judged by both the player and the audience. The term better, however, can mean different qualities for the player and different qualities for the audience. So what are the factors that affect the playability of a musical instrument? And what factors are important for the quality of sound judged by players and listeners? When a player interacts with a musical instrument, they not only hear the sound, but they also feel the vibrations. This is what we call acoustic feedback. This feedback allows the player to judge what is happening and alter the sound they produce. The radiated sound is further altered by the acoustics of the room before it arrives in the ears of the listener. So, in ensuring sound quality, all these stages play a very important role. A musical sound is a periodic vibration of air pressure that we sense through our ears. The exact shape of this vibration is called waveform, and on my slide you can see three waveforms. The first is a very simple sinusoidal line, which corresponds to the sound produced by a tuning fork. The second is the waveform of a guitar sound, and the third, the waveform of a sound produced from a piano. In fact, the old style records engraved the waveform shape in the grooves, and when the needle followed the groove, the sound wave was replicated. Most waveforms have complex shapes, but we can break this down into a series of simpler sinusoidal waveforms, each with its own frequency and amplitude. 
If the frequencies of the sinusoidal waveforms are multiple integers of the lowest frequency, we call them harmonics. If they are not, we call them overtones. So a sound can be fully described by all of its harmonics with their individual frequencies and amplitudes. When looking at a sound, it is often useful to see its waveform as a function of time, but we can also view it as a graph of the relative amplitude of its overtones against their frequency. We call this the sound spectrum. On my slide at the top, you can see a sinusoidal waveform on the left and its spectrum on the right. In the middle, we have a lower frequency sinusoidal wave and its spectrum. Notice that the peak in the spectrum is further to the left. At the bottom, we have a complex waveform, which is compact equal amplitudes. So let's have a look at some real sound spectra and listen to the corresponding sounds. The first is the note D4 played on a kalimba. And the second is the same note played on a guitar. I hope you can see that the guitar spectrum is richer in harmonics than the kalimba. Can you also hear the difference this makes to the sounds? So let's listen to the kalimba first. And let's listen to the guitar. I hope you can now understand why a sound spectrum is a useful tool in analyzing and understanding musical sounds. But having said that, we need to be aware of something very important. The spectrum of a sound is continuously changing as the sound develops over time. So these spectra represent a slice in time. And what you see in this sound spectra will change as the sound progresses. Visible differences in sound spectra do not necessarily mean that we can perceive the differences in the sounds. In these two spectra, you can clearly see differences. They have been generated by the same professional player on the same saxophone, using the same reed, playing the same notes, but playing it in a slightly different way. Well, let's see if you can hear the difference. So I'll play the top first and then the bottom. Some of you probably were able to hear it, but maybe not everybody. So we need to be very careful when we try to link the objective characteristics of a series of the sound as we judge it when we hear it. Let us have a look now at how musical instruments are classified. There are many different classifications, such as stringed, woodwinds, percussions, or idiophones, membranophones, and more. But for today, I propose a classification that relates to the physics of how the sound is produced. I am sure most of us have experienced playing on a swing. A swing is a very good example of an oscillator. If the swing receives an initial push and it then vibrates by itself, this is what we call a free oscillation. If, on the other hand, somebody pushes the swing at regular time intervals, the swing will vibrate according to the rhythm of the push. We call this forced vibration. So we can classify musical instruments as free and forced oscillators. In guitars, pianos, tubular bells, and timpani, energy is provided only once. In the violin family and all wind instruments, energy is provided continuously by bowing or by blowing. The sound of all instruments will depend on the modes of vibration of the instrument, which are influenced by its physical characteristics. 
for free oscillator instruments like the guitar, the sound is also affected by the initial conditions of the oscillator. For forced oscillator instruments like the violin, the sound is also affected by the way the driving force varies over time. We will start by describing the physics of a very simple free oscillator, a mass connected with a spring that is given an initial stretch and then left to vibrate freely. The equation of motion can be seen on the left of my slide, uh, where the first term is the acceleration of the system, uh, which is the second derivative of the displacement. And the second term is a product of the displacement and the square of a constant that we call angular frequency, which relates to the stiffness of the spring and the mass of the system. The solution of this equation can be seen at the bottom right. The displacement of the system is a sinusoidal function that we call simple harmonic motion. You can see the amplitude of the vibration, A naught, and the initial phase, phi as well. This pattern of motion, where a system vibrates at a specific frequency, which depends on its physical... Having this simple free oscillator in mind, with one normal mode, we can now look at systems that have more masses and more springs. For example, a system made of three masses has three transverse normal modes where the masses vibrate up and down. You can see this on the top left of my slide. There are also three additional longitudinal modes where the masses vibrate sideways. So, extending this idea, and focusing on the transverse normal modes, we can now imagine a string as a series of many mass spring systems, which will have many normal modes of vibration. And indeed, strings have many normal modes of vibration. You can see the first six of these modes in the animation, and you can also describe these modes through the mathematical equation on the left. You can see that the equation gives the frequencies as a function of the tension, length, and mass per unit length of the string. Notice that the frequencies are multiple integers of the lowest, the fundamental, or as we call it, the first harmonic. On every mode, you can recognize points that do not move which we call nodes, and points that have the largest displacement, which we call antinodes. This vibrating pattern is called a standing wave. Of course, reality is always more complicated. The normal modes of vibration are affected by damping and stiffness. Dumping is a reduction in the amplitude of an oscillation caused by energy being lost. Dumping reduces the frequencies of the normal modes. In addition, real strings are stiff, and this limits the number of normal modes and also deharmonizes them. To overcome the unwanted effect of stiffness, we use wound strings. Compared to a solid string of the same mass, wound strings are much less stiff. Once a string is plucked, it will start to vibrate freely. The free vibration will be a combination of all its normal modes. Each mode will contribute by a different amount depending on the initial conditions of the string release. For example, the position at which the string is plucked will affect these initial conditions. Each mode will then decay by a different rate that depends on its damping. In the spectra on my slide, time runs from the back of the diagram to the front. You can see big spikes at the start of the sound at the back, and these decay towards the front. 
observe the spectra of the two sounds we will hear. Look at their differences and look how they evolve in time. Now let's listen to them. That's the top. So you might have noticed that on the first sound, some harmonics were gaining and losing strength, where on the second sound, the sound was smoother. On classical guitars, the string is not released with zero speed. It gets released after it slides over the fingernail of the player. The physical properties of the fingernail will alter the initial conditions of string release. Have a look at the simulation for a piano string while it is struck by the hammer and afterwards when it is released. In a similar way that as with the finger the fingertip of the, the fingernail of the player in guitar, the physical characteristics of the hammer and the felt on the hammer will strongly influence the subsequent sound. After the animation, you will actually hear the sound that this simulation has created as well. To end the discussion of free oscillations and the importance of the initial conditions, let us consider something very familiar, the sound of Big Ben. During given to the hammer, so that the sound of the Big Ben was not altered. Have a listen to the technician. So, this is one of the hammers of the fourth quarter bell. This is the one where we've got two Hammerheads, one here, one just beside me. And what we're having a look at while we've got them apart is the face of the hammer is actually wearing away because it's constantly bashing on the, the bell itself. So, what we're looking at is either reprofiling this hammer, give it a nice dome again, or what we're looking at is turn the hammer around and go to a new face which they happen to have cast on for us 160 years ago. So there's pros and cons for both of it. If you reprofile this, you don't have to take everything else apart, but the hammer then becomes slightly lighter. If it becomes slightly lighter, it will actually give it a different tone when hitting the bell. So do we take more off or just use the fresh end? What do you want to do? <laughs> The question. Okay, so we will start our discussion on forced oscillators now by listening to the trick of a very tiny frog. something special if it wants to be heard by a nearby female. The size and shape of the hole are critical. Then does something remarkable. Mm -hmm. 
It begins with a sound check. Too low. He changes pitch. Too high. That's it. So, remind yourself of the forced vibration of the swing when an adult pushes a child at regular time intervals. In this animation, you see three identical oscillators, all being pushed by the same force, but the rhythm of the push, in other words, the frequency of the driving force, is different. Do you notice that the oscillator in the middle has the largest amplitude? This is because the frequency of the driving force coincides with the frequency of the normal mode of this oscillator. We call this resonance. The marimba is a percussion instrument where the player strikes tone bars. Under every tone bar, there is a resonator tube. The free oscillations of the tone bar provide the driving force for the forced oscillations of the air inside the resonator tube. So let's listen to the marimba. When we look at the waveform of a note, we notice that the start of the waveform is very busy, but it then settles into a more or less sinusoidal shape. This early short period is called the transient. During this time, the air in the resonator tube vibrates at its own normal modes, as if it was a free oscillator. Very soon, however, a steady state establishes at the frequency of the driving force, in other words, the resonance. If we look at the equation of motion of a forced oscillator, we notice that three new terms have appeared. The first term is mass multiplied by acceleration. The second term describes the damping as a product of the velocity of the oscillator and a parameter that we call mechanical resistance R. The third term describes the stiffness of the spring. The last term describes the driving force as a function of time. The solution of this equation can be seen on the top right and has two different terms. The first term describes the transient behavior of the oscillator, and the second term describes the steady state behavior. In other words, its resonance. Notice that in the transient term, that relates to the mass and the mechanical resistance of the system. In the steady state term, we also have a new parameter, which we call mechanical impedance, Z, which is a measure of how much a structure resists motion when subjected to a force. We already mentioned that at resonance, the displacement becomes maximum. This means that the product of angular frequency and impedance become minimum. So, at this resonant frequency, the driving force supplies maximum power to the forced oscillator. If we take the ideal case where the damping at the resonant frequency is zero, then the amplitude will become infinite. The damping makes the peak of the resonant frequency lower and wider, whilst slightly lowering its frequency at the same time. So for this reason, we introduce a new parameter that we call quality factor Q. The quality factor measures the rate of decay of energy of the oscillator. A higher Q indicates a lower rate of energy loss, which means the oscillation die out more slowly. In simple words, the quality factor measures the sharpness of in Q over pi periods, the amplitude will fall to about a third of its original value. 
To understand the effect of the quality factor on the sound, we will look now at an acoustic example. We're going to listen to the sound of a triangle. And I can tell you that the sound has been truncated when the amplitude was decayed by one over E. We are then going to estimate the duration of the sound, and then we will try to estimate Q, the Q value. So let's listen to the sound. So you might have estimated that this sound lasted about two seconds. So the question is, can we calculate the Q value? Is the Q value 50, 500 or 5000? We said that in Q over pi periods, the amplitude decays by one over E. So for us, that means Q over pi multiplied by one over 800 is equal to two. And if you do a quick calculation in your head, then you can see that the Q value of this sound is 5000. We have mentioned all the major building blocks that allow us to understand the anatomy of musical instruments. If we consider a two-dimensional oscillator, like a membrane, we can see that the normal modes of vibration are described by a pair of numbers. Each number indicates the number of antinodes along and across the oscillator. Notice that in a two-dimensional oscillator, the nodes are entire lines and not just single points. This is why we call them nodal lines. The normal modes of a thin plate are heavily influenced by the physical properties of the material, such as the Young's modulus, which is radio, which measures the deformation of a material in directions perpendicular to the direction of loading. The equation you see is for isotropic plates, where the physical properties of the material have the same value in all directions. Wood, which is typically used for building many musical instruments, is not isotropic. So this complicates matters further. So if we look at the top plate modes of a guitar as an example, the frequency and the shape of the top plate modes depend on the physical properties of the wood, the shape of the wood, and the way it is supported. Using holographic interferometry, a technique that we will explain later, and the same mode as it is simulated using finite element analysis. In finite element analysis, the material is modeled with a series of small elements, each with their own properties. The air contained within an instrument, like a violin or a guitar, is also a component part with its own normal modes of vibration. You might have played with bottles filled with water at different heights. What you hear when you blow in such a bottle is the resonant frequency of the air inside the bottle. This normal mode of vibration is called the Helmholtz mode, and it depends on the volume of the air inside the cavity. Remember the tree frog. It found the resonant frequency of the air cavity and used it to generate a high amplitude vibration of the air in the cavity, which created a louder sound. Looking at the physics of the Helmholtz resonator, we can see that it resembles our simple mass being the volume of the air in the cavity and the piston being the mass of the air in the neck. The Helmholtz frequency depends on the opening area A, the volume of the cavity V, and the neck length L. In most stringed instruments, the neck length corresponds to the thickness of the wood that makes the top plate. When two or more oscillators are connected together, allowing energy to flow from one to another, we say that they are coupled. Coupling changes the normal modes of both oscillators. It can also be strong or weak, and this depends in part on the frequencies of the normal modes of the oscillators. 
Strong coupling means high energy exchange, which can be desirable in certain situations and undesirable in others. In violins, for example, if one of the normal modes of the string vibration couples strongly with one of the normal modes of the body, we get what we call a wolf note. This is undesirable because when the player plays this particular note, the sound is very unstable. Listen to it. You can think of all instruments being made by a series of component parts which behave as coupled oscillators. For example, in a guitar, the strings are coupled to the bridge and top plate, which are themselves coupled to the air cavity, the sound hole and the ribs, which are subsequently coupled to the back plate. Having examined the modes of the different parts of an instrument, we can now talk about the modes of the whole instrument. On the left, you see the first six modes of the top and back plate of a violin calculated from finite element analysis. The colors show phase difference of 180 degrees. In other words, when the red region is up, the blue region is down. On the right side, you can see the first five body modes of an assembled violin-shaped box. It is clear, I hope, from the two pictures that the body modes are very different than the modes of the individual parts they came from. When looking at wind instruments, the vibrational modes of the air column can be described by the displacement of the air particles or by the pressure difference from the atmospheric, which we call acoustic pressure. When air particles cannot move, in other words, a displacement node, the acoustic pressure changes from maximum to minimum, so it is a pressure antinode. You can see this in the animation. The close end of the tube on the right is a displacement node and an acoustic pressure antinode. Similarly, the open end of the tube on the left is a displacement antinode and an acoustic pressure node because the pressure is equal to the atmospheric, which means the pressure difference is zero. The equation that describes the vibration of the air column inside a tube can be seen on the right. The speed of the longitudinal waves depends on two parameters, the bulk modulus of elasticity and the air density at equilibrium. The solutions of this equation, which describe the normal modes of vibration of the air column, are similar to the normal modes of free string vibration, and they depend on how the tube ends. For a tube closed at both ends, the normal modes are identical to these of a free string fixed at both ends. For a tube with one end closed and the other open, the frequencies of the normal modes are harmonically related, but only the odd harmonics are present. Notice that they depend on the length of the tube and the speed of sound. Instruments like the trumpet, trombone, clarinet, saxophone and oboe are examples of this. They are open to the outside air at the bell, but they are closed by the mouthpiece, the reed and the player's mouth at the other end. When you overblow these instruments, the frequency jumps from the first harmonic to the third. In other words, it triples because there is no second harmonic. Let's listen to it. For a tube with both ends open, the frequencies of the normal modes are harmonically related and all harmonics are present. The flute, pan pipes and recorder are examples of this. The player leaves the embouchure hole open to the air as they blow across it. When you overblow these instruments, the frequency jumps from the first harmonic to the second. In other words, it doubles.
Let us now look at the brass instrument, the trumpet. Notice the mouthpiece, the valves and the bell. The valves help the player to produce additional notes by changing the length of the air column. When a valve is pressed down, it increases the length of the trumpet by directing the air through the additional tubing on the valve block. There are three valves and each has a different length of tubing. This increases the number of notes this instrument can produce. In brass instruments, the player's lips act as a valve for flow control. The lips introduce puffs of air at just the right time to maintain oscillations of the air cone. The player must control their lips to get approximately the right resonant frequency. The pressure pulses, which are reflected back from the bore, will then force the player's lips to open at exactly the right time. You can see this in the slow motion video. We mentioned that the trumpet sound contains only odd harmonics. Actually, the mouthpiece and the bell are able to shift these frequencies and produce a new harmonic series that now has all the harmonics. The way this is done is beyond the, the scope of this talk, but to show you how important the mouthpiece and the bell are to the sound, I'm going to show you a video. Well, I'm going to show you on a very primitive piece of equipment. Uh, this is a, a piece of uh, vinyl hose that you can buy at Lowe's. I think I bought this at Lowe's uh, not too long ago. And uh, it's vinyl tubing. It's, for those of you who might be interested, it's 3 8 inch in inside diameter. But basically, when you take a mouthpiece and you put it in a length of tubing, it'll resonate on certain notes. And I'll show you how that works. Here's a mouthpiece alone. But when you put it in a piece of tubing, it comes out about like this. And then what uh, this is, this is just a plastic funnel, but this is just like the bell on the brass instrument. And what this is, is like a megaphone it actually takes that same sound and makes it louder. Now, we are now going to move to Goodwins and under the sound of a Middle Eastern flute, I'm going to tell you that they are often classified by the sound source. The air jet instruments like the flutes, the single reed instruments like clarinet, and the double reed instruments like the oboe or the bassoon. As we have already mentioned, they behave as tubes open at either one or both ends. The air is set into motion by hitting an edge or a single reed, as in the animation, or by the vibration of a double reed. Let's now take a look at a single reed instrument, like the clarinet. The reed receives one pull and one push as the pressure pulse makes two complete trips up and down the pipe. On the first round trip, the negative pressure pulls the reed closed. On the second round trip, the positive pressure pushes the reed open, it lets more air in and amplifies the next injected pulse. This is how the air in the pipe forces the vibrating reed to lock in on the natural frequency of the air column. The reed itself has low mass and is easily influenced by the pressure pulses. It is like a child trying to push a heavy adult on a swing. It will only succeed if it pushes at the right frequency. Woodwind instruments have tone holes and register holes. We're going to start by looking at the tone holes of a recorder. An open tone hole creates a pressure node as it connects the instrument's bore to the air outside. It changes the effective length of the air column in the instrument and therefore the fundamental frequency of the tone. A register hole reduces the strength of a resonance 
by leaking a little air at the point of maximum pressure for that mold. For this reason, register holes change the fundamental frequency by changing the length of the tube. They can also change the relative intensity of the harmonics by favoring some harmonics against others. For example, a register hole a third of the way encourages the third mode. A register hole a fifth of the way dumps the first and the third mode and encourages the fifth. So let's have a look at the three main experimental techniques for visualizing vibrations. Er Ernest Klugny was a German physicist and musician. His most important work included research on vibrating plates and calculating the speed of sound for different gases. His experiment on vibrating plates is easy to replicate in a lab using a signal generator, a vibration generator, and a bit of salt, as you can see. As you sweep through the frequencies, patterns appear when the frequency of the generator matches one of the normal modes of vibration. The salt stays only along the nodal lines. The areas on opposite sides of a nodal line vibrate. Um, so what I wanted to say is that holographic interferometry enables us to measure displacement of object to a precision of fractions of a wavelength. Um, you can see that the laser beam is split into two, uh, the reference and the object beam. Uh, the object beam shines on the instrument first that is revealed, allows us to see contour lines of equal displacement, and of course this allows us to measure the displacement of the surface at any point. And laser Doppler vibrometry uh, is a cutting edge technique that is used um, today. The amplitude and frequency of a vibrating surface are extracted from the Doppler shift of the reflected laser beam, and it can measure velocities within 0.02 micrometers per second. And I just wanted to show you a bit of that. I'll quickly, very quickly talk about uh, sound radiation and mention that different body modes radiate sound in different amounts. So we try to make all modes asymmetric so that some radiation can um, come from all of them. Really mentioned uh, the difference in sound perception by the player and the audience. And you can see the main bullet points here. So I don't need to add anything. Um, the objective against subjective characteristics of sounds, again, which you can, um, you can look on my screen. And what I want to finish uh, is the idea of quality of sound. And I wanted to say that quality of sound is governed by choices and compromises. And for example, a maker has to choose how to distribute the energy amongst the modes. And if they decide to bias the energy towards the low frequencies, they may make a character full instrument. But if they decide to spread the energy more evenly, they may make a more neutral instrument. But we, um, we also should not forget that um, the visual and tactile attractiveness of an instrument are important for the player, the interaction with the player. So this is another choice uh, of how the instrument is being built. Finally, the expectation of the player is equally important. Um, so the, if the player expects that the quality of sound is going to be high, if you tell them that they, they are playing a Stradivarius, for example, then they may play even better than on their own violin, for example. So when we judge the quality of sound, we should not forget the, that this sound has come as an outcome of many choices and compromises that were made beforehand. Um, final slide that you missed uh, was that we are now building new materials and we are trying to see if we can make 
tailor-made instruments for specific players or for types of music. And finally, we might be able in the future to find a reliable way to measure the psychoacoustics effect of the instrument on the player. And who knows what this will reveal. So I'm, I'm sorry we had technical problems. I'll stop sharing and I, I will come up again. Um, and Okay, well, thank you very much, Maria, for absolutely, uh, I mean, total thorough um, grounding in understanding of the acoustics of musical instruments. And I think that was a very thorough, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, so we can't, we can't do, we can do visual applause, but it's... <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> so, um, so I, let me see whether we've got some questions um, from, from the audience. Let's see if I can get the question and answers. Let's see, I'll close the chat down here. Question answers. Got one one question here. If I can open it, so we had this we had this problem last week. Are you there, Sharon? So I can see one question. Um, it I I I can see it. Um, okay, I cannot see it. So go ahead. Okay. Sorry. So quality and sound and tim timbre are the same thing. So what we call quality of sound means different things to different people. So to a musician, quality of sound will mean different things. To the audience, it might mean different things. And this is the, the point I was trying to make, that we, we can talk about objective characteristics of sound. We can say this sound has high frequencies, it reach, is rich in high, high frequencies. But then when it is being judged in terms of quality, you will find that different people will disagree uh, because different people expect or want different things from the sound. So I hope this answers your question. Uh, so Sam says, I wonder what effects new material and digital fabrication techniques are having on instrument design. So the, the interesting thing about new materials and especially carbon fibers is that uh, carbon fibers is something that you can control its properties. Wood, you cannot control its properties. Uh, it's whatever wood you can um, you can find, and okay, there are some uh, some uh, uh, properties that maybe you can you can choose the right wood, but it's not something that you can you can really construct in the lab. Where uh, carbon fibers, you can, and you can make them stiffer, and you can make them less stiff. You can you can really um, tailor make an instrument, a musical instrument. But on the other hand, a carbon fiber, fiber musical instrument looks very different. And if the player doesn't like the look of it, they might not play well on it. So this is where the expectation of the player is very, very important because at the end of the day, the sound that comes out is not just from the instrument, it's from the interaction with the player. So keep the player happy and the sound will be good. Keep the player unhappy and give them the top musical instrument you make, they're not going to, good, to create a good sound. Um, I can see another question. Do you think that many musicians are aware of the science behind their instruments? To an extent, I don't think they, they know all the details because all the details are quite, um, Shall we say they might be easy to describe, but they are not easy to uh, model or to understand. Um, heavy maths go into musical acoustics very, very quickly. So <laughs> I would say that, yeah, they know the basics, but when it comes to detail, uh, then there's, that's, that's where they stop. What type of materials can you use for customizing an instrument for a player? I think what I said before, um, carbon fibers, because you can build the material, basically materials that you can build to special properties, special Young's modules, a, a specific Young's modules or a specific uh, other properties, then, um, then you can make the material as you want it. And that allows you to make the musical instrument 
um, as you want it. I don't know if there's any other question. I can't see any more. Yeah. Can I just let me ask one question? So, uh, Maria, so there's the mysterious Stradivarius. <laughs> Do we know enough about the Stradivarius and the mysteries of it? I mean, given all the psycho, psych, psych, psychological aspects of it. Yes. Right? Imagine that a player would feel really good playing a Stradivarius, knowing these, it's a Stradivarius. Yeah. I suppose you could give them another instrument that isn't a Stradivarius and see where, and not tell them and see what yes. happens. And, and this is exactly what I wanted to say. In fact, they have done experiments like this. They have given um, uh, professional musicians a high quality violin and a Stradivarius. So mixed within the high quality violins and they were asked to try to guess the Stradivarius and they couldn't. Ah, right, okay. okay. So we do know, we do know what makes a good musical instrument. Yeah. Um, sure. uh, and the other point I wanted to make about the Stradivarius is that this is a very old instrument that has gone through, well, all these instruments, they have gone through tweaks over the years. So yeah. what we might call a Stradivarius today is not what it was 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. It has been improved and tweaked to sustain a high quality sound. Yeah. The, the technical question I was aiming at was, can we measure enough about a violin, a wooden violin or perhaps a Stradivarius to actually re, remake it to, to have the same sound quality in, in say car, in carbon fiber? I mean, is that-, is that Well, the starting point is the wood and there are no two pieces of wood which are identical. And that is where the, the question is, you're given a piece of wood, and the aim of a professional instrument maker is to get the best out of this particular piece of wood. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where um, it might be um, interesting to look at materials where we build the material first and then we build the musical instrument. But I, what my question was, was given a, a particular Stradivarius or a particular violin that yeah, has its own characteristics, because of the wood that was chosen, etc., and the handcraft that went into it, could you actually, could you measure enough about it, enough about its characteristics to actually replicate the sound with with say carbon fiber? Okay. Is that possible. So if you replicate the the normal modes, yeah. Okay. That does not guarantee that it's going to make the same sound. No, no, that's that's the question. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Because. The, the, the characteristics the, the, the characteristics of the sound are directly linked to the the wood itself so until you are able to replicate everything including the wood you are not going to replicate the Stradivarius yeah but you don't have to you can make a very very high quality instrument which will be um, equally good as a Stradivarius Mm. Um, it, it does relate to, yeah, the quality of the wood, the starting material is very important. And then, of course, knowing what you do with it yeah. uh, does the rest. I see there's another question if we can. I can't see that. Can you see, Mary, the, the, the question? Um, I'm also interested in things like shaping and forming in new ways, such as laser cutting, 3D printing, etc. OK, so I know that there are 3D printing flutes and with wind, woodwinds, you can do 3D printing because you don't care so much about the, the, the body of the instrument because what is important is the air inside it. So that's fine. You can 3D print flutes cheaply and they will have a reasonably good sound. I mean, you saw the, um, uh, the guy made a trumpet out of a hose pipe and, a, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the, uh, a cone at the end. Uh, but when we talk about uh, stringed instruments where the body of the instrument plays a major role because that is the, the vibrating part and that is the one that couples to everything else, then it's not easy to 3D print. Okay, then. Well, thank you very much, Maria, again, for, for giving this uh, really interesting uh, sort of comprehensive uh, education in in, uh, in all we wanted to know about musical instruments uh, and some nice physics as well uh, so 
you know, that's, uh, I mean, that, that sort of physics is what we get in the first year, I think, in, in, in uh, mechanics, isn't it, really? Well, that's the sort of thing that we teach if you haven't done yep. the A level. But um, that, that would be... Uh, that, that would be part of the of the syllabus in the, in the, in our first year mechanics courses. So, um, if there are any more questions, then um, you will get a uh, you will get a, an email directly from the IOP straight after this, um, and uh, and you should reply to the email address there um, to the IOP um, regions. I can't remember the name of the I can't remember the email, but anyway, the email will be there, and also there's a, a link. To a survey that you can help us um, help us to evaluate, you know how how good a job we're doing here. So um, so thank you very much again, Maria. It's fascinating stuff, and I'm sure that um, we'll all be playing carbon fiber guitars before. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. I actually have a bass guitar made from from carbon fiber. Oh right, okay. <laughs> That's amazing. That's good. Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> So thank you very much and thank you to everybody um, for bearing with us during the, again, the technical problems we had. I'm sorry about that, but um, we'll get it right soon. So, and that's the, that's actually it for, that's the end, that's our last talk for this season. So, um, so we'll, I guess we'll be back, we should surely be back in, in the autumn and, um, and maybe we can update, you can update us on what's going on in the musical world sometime in the future. So that would be great. Okay. okay. Thank you much, very thank much, you. everybody, and uh, have a good evening. Bye bye. Bye bye.